We're grateful to the support that we enjoy from Creative Scotland and Education Scotland because that provides the funding that enables us to have the kind of conversation we're having today. For me, this is a really exciting and in a way a classic creative conversation that's all about connections and I'll say a lot more about that when I introduce our first speaker. But I do want to thank somebody who's not with us today and that's Bethan Owen who sadly is poorly, but Bethan was a real driving force in pulling this conversation together. It was she who provided the initial impetus around it, and she's been a real guiding force in trying to get us to the stage that we're at today. So it's really sad that she's lost her voice and is in poor health. But Bethan, thank you, and I hope if you're not listening to the, the conversation, you'll catch up with it in recording, because it's very much down to you that we're having it. But acting as Beth and Owen, in a rare sort of public appearance in that guise, is Catherine Graham, who's the One Plus Two Development Officer. Uh, and I'm going to ask Catherine now just to come in and put today's conversation in context in terms of Languages Week and more, Catherine. So over to you. Thanks, David. I appreciate that. I will try my best um, to lead up with what Bethan had planned to do. Um, as, as David said, we're delighted to see so many people here this afternoon um, at this creative conversation. It certainly is something that we are and, and have been looking forward to for, for a long time. It's a really good way for us to to be celebrating Languages Week Scotland. It is something that we all know is, is very important. And for Languages Week Scotland, we know that it's a, a week where we get to every year, beginning of February, to celebrate the signed and spoken languages that are used and learned across Scotland. And we are in a, a privileged position in Scotland with our one plus two approach where we do have every um, pupil having an entitlement to languages from primary one through to S3 um, at the, the very minimum. And we hope that our le learners will continue that language journey beyond S3 as well. We know that Edinburgh is a very multicultural city. In fact, Scotland is, is a multicultural country with a rich linguistic diversity. None of our schools are monolingual communities. We've had and we continue to have many pupils and families and staff in our school communities who are bilingual and monolingual. But what the one plus two approach, what the introduction of the one plus two approach has done for us has ensured that none of our schools, none of our learners are monolingual. Everybody is learning a language in our schools. And for us, that is key because some of our key aspects of the, the Edinburgh Learns for Life vision and goals, such as equality, inclusion and connected communities can be supported through language learning. As practitioners, we're looking to support our young people to operate confidently, to flourish in a multilingual, multicultural world. We want them to see connections in their different linguistic heritages rather than divisions. We want them to see the opportunities that languages can bring to build relationships, to build communities. As you mentioned, David, that connection is key. We know that language learning brings many benefits to individuals and society as a whole. We also know that language learning is a lifelong process and that it looks very different for us all. I mean, each one of the speakers that you'll hear today, we've all had a different language learning journey, but that is what the one plus two approach is for us. It's a language learning journey. It starts in primary one for some of our pupils. For some of our pupils, the language learning journey has started way beyond. It started from birth and it will continue throughout our schools. Today, you're going to have a chance in this conversation to listen to speakers talk about bilingualism and its impact on cognitive function, as well as explore the one plus two journey, its impact on pupils, staff and schools. I know this is something that I've really been looking forward to for a while because I know when I visit schools, when I hear about what schools are doing, schools have adopted, they have um, open with open arms the one plus two approach and they've found really creative ways of ensuring that that entitlement that our pupils have to experience language learning is provided and I'm really looking forward to hearing what everybody says about that so I'm going to stop speaking just now and I'm going to pass back to you David but thank you very much. Well I, <clears throat> I'm just going to have you back every time you do this because that was brilliant um, and I think what you did Catherine which was really important was not just put the conversation in a much wider context but I think you did that with passion and commitment 
and you made the connections um, because you talked about creative approaches and you talked about the enrichment that bilingualism brings. And again, we, as part of this conversation, we hope that people will recognise how that feeds in to the wider creativity that we require. And I think I particularly love the comments that you made about community and that sense of community, both locally and more widely, and the need for us to see ourselves as citizens in the world. And frankly, in a week of the most depressing news, I can recall for quite some time, nearly a fortnight, I think, um, but faced with that depressing news, to get that vote of confidence in our capacity to learn to be citizens of a wider world, that strikes me as a goal worth reaching for through this conversation. And I hope that everyone will reach for it. Um, we've got the chat function on. I'll be keeping my eye on the chat function. I'll try and pick up on comments. I'll try and pick up on questions and bring them into the discussion. So please, everyone, make yourselves part of this conversation. I'm now really delighted to welcome Thomas back. Tom Ash seems to me to, to typify what we're about in terms of creative conversations. He's a man who makes connections and talks about connections. He's a neuroscientist, but his work in neuroscience has taken him into the whole area of the impact of bilingualism. He's looked at it in relation to ageing. He's looked at it on a, a lifelong basis. He's looked at it in connection to specific conditions like aphasia. He's looked at bilingualism as a force that changes the way we make connections the way our brains deal with, with the, the, the neuro connections that we've talked about in other conversations. I had the privilege of watching him on YouTube. I was hugely impressed. Um, he's obviously quite a clever lad, um, and I think he's got a lot to bring to today's conversation. But what he will do is he'll bring that bread, he'll make these connections, and he will seriously underwrite our claim for the conversation that language is about more than learning to speak a different way. So, Tom Ash, a huge creative conversation. Welcome to you. I'm delighted to pass over to you now. Okay, well, thank you very much for kind words. So, could I ask for the... And by the way, I have my uh, handle for my Twitter. So, if you have any comments and so on, please you uh, do tag me in. Uh, I, I am quite active member of the Twitter community, as you will notice. Okay, so could I have next slide, please? Perfect. Okay, so now let me start by being maybe slightly provocative, but I think you will quickly realize what I think the, the point is. So imagine that we are speaking now about a strange medical condition. Could you press once so that we have the first line? Uh, epidemiologically, it's something which was originally rare, but now is reaching epidemic proportions in some areas. Could I have next line, please? There are some bad news. It causes cognitive deficits, for instance, in executive functions, very, very important in our brain function. It can accelerate cognitive aging and it can accelerate the onset of dementia. And it leads to more severe cognitive deficits after stroke. Can I have next line, please? However, they are good news. It's reversible if recognized and properly treated. Now, if I would tell you something like this, wouldn't you say, well, we have to work on that. This is really something where we can make a difference. So, if you press once again, you will find out which condition I'm speaking about, namely monolingualism. Now, there is a reason why I like to change the tables. Because, can I have the next slide, please? And the next line. Because very often, if we look at the default assumptions, the general perception will be that monolingualism people speaking just one language, seems to be clear, basic, simple, and if you press once again, next line, natural. In contrast, if you press again, please, multilingualism seems to be complicated things. 
if we press again, uh, it is something which needs explanations. And if you press again, then there are some papers in which I wrote about it. So in a way, intuitively, and maybe next uh, next line again. Uh, so intuitively, we can think that it is natural, it is easier to think about one language monolingualism and not about multilingualism. But the problem is, if we set monolingualism as the default assumption, it has important consequences for many things. So can I have next slide, please? And the first line. So firstly, it will have consequences for language policy and ideology, because then you would think, well, the normal situation for a country, for a society, should be that people speak only one language. Next line, please. It will have very important consequences for statistics for what we think, how many languages are spoken. I have been fighting for several years. Uh, I mean, in uh, ONS, um, the uh, Office for National Statistics in London, but also with National Records of Scotland here in Edinburgh, trying to convince them that they should not ask in census, allowing people only one language and asking what is your main language. I mean, the comparison I made is if you have someone with several kids, will you ask such a person, please tell me who is your main child? Is it the first or the last or the one who is doing best at school or the one who makes most problems and so on? The question to ask a multilingual for the main language means that you simply don't know what multilingualism is and assumes everybody must be monolingual. Unfortunately, there data that we get about language spoken in UK will be heavily biased, immensely underestimating the number of languages because people are not allowed to tell them. And then the argument will be made, OK, we don't have to invest in it because no one really speaks them anyway. So we have a self-fulfilling prophecy. We have a vicious circle in which the questions are asked in order to minimize languages. And then this is taken as an example, as a reason for being, so to say, making them irrelevant. Then next uh, point, research. Very often, the whole research about whether brain, whether medicine, whether psychology and so on is simply assuming we are only looking at monolingual speakers. The next point, which obviously will be very, very obvious to the audience here, is education. So again, if we assume that monolingual is normal, then we think about adding languages to the curriculum. So in a way, the normal thing is just to have one and then maybe we can add, but maybe we don't have to. If we assume multilingualism as the default, then the normal state is to have many languages. And basically what we are doing by not teaching languages is robbing people, robbing children of their opportunity to do what their natural thing would be, namely learning more than one language. And can I have next line, please? And of course, in medicine, dementia and so on. I mean, the question again, or the idea is that basically uh, all the services will be only provided in one language for people speaking one language. Now, there are, can I go to the next slide, please? There is a long tradition of thinking of monolingualism as default. And of course, all of you will recognize, maybe if you press uh, three times, we'll get the citation from Genesis, about the whole air speaking one language and one speech. So here we have the idea of monolingualism being the natural state and in fact multilingualism being the fall from grace. However, can I have next line? In fact, if we look at creation myths for many, from many, many civilizations across the world, we find something opposite, that the natural thing is to have different languages. So in Australia, you have the uh, legend of the ancestress goddess, Waramurungunji, who basically travels into Australia and then gives people different land, food, and language. And in fact, if we look at the hunter-gatherer societies that exist nowadays anywhere in the world, then 
you will find that multilingualism is the rule. In fact, you have very often the so-called rule of linguistic exogamy. It is perceived as taboo, as incestuous to marry someone who speaks the same language. So basically per default, kids grow up with parents speaking two different languages and grandparents probably speaking four different languages. So why is it relevant? Because this is the situation in which the human language seems to have developed. So evolutionary, I would say, human language develop in multilingual surroundings. Can I have next slide, please? But then the next argument could come, OK, but maybe once we start having states or even empires, then you know, the uh, linguistic fragmentation becomes a problem and then you have just one language. But across human history, you have both. So on the left side of the slide, I have a picture from Persepolis from the old Persian Achaemenid Empire, which was incredibly multilingual, which in fact, where the ruling class spoke a language which was different to the one which was the official, so to say, administration language. So one was Aramaic, the other was Old Persian. And then basically all communities spoke their own languages. And it was quite a powerful empire for many centuries. Below that, you have a figure of Mithridates, a, a ruler of Pontius, who is said to, said with, uh, to have said with pride that he can speak in all 27 languages of his uh, subjects so that he can converse with every single subject of his realm in his or her own language. On the right, you have Paul of opposite policies, the idea that you have to unify introducing only one language. Uh, so you will recognize, of course, uh, James VI, uh, who was not a big fan of Gallic languages culture and, of course, led, which led to the status of Iona. But above it, you have an Inca emperor, just to show that this is not about kind of East and West. You have different models in different continents and civilizations. So Incas, for instance, were pretty centralizing as well and wanted to impose Quechua as the empire language. So that means historically, it's not that every state, every empire and so on had to be monolingual. Some were, but some were very consciously multilingual. Next slide, please. And now we come, of course, to education. Now, I am very, very proud to live in Scotland with this one plus two model of education. And I would say that's what we had for most of human histories in most of places where education was really written with a large E. So in the old classical schools, and here on the right are pictures from my own school in Krakow, to which, I mean, high school, secondary school to which I went, where we could see the uh, School of Athens by Raphael painted on the ceiling. And the idea was the old schools would have had Latin and Greek, so they were at least two different languages. You have examples from history of Spain where you have Alfonso el Sabio, uh, Alfonso the Wise, the king, who was writing his prose work in Spanish, but his poetry in Portuguese. And in 19th century, very often educated people across Europe were learning French, German, and English, usually being able at least to read in all of them. And in history of neurology, which is one of my uh, areas, it's very obvious from reading the work from, you know, late 19th or early 20th century that they all really relevant people knew those three languages because they are citing each other in a time where, of course, Google translation didn't exist. But you find something, can, you, can I have uh, next lines, please? So if you press, exactly. So here we have Latin and Greek in Europe, uh, Spanish and Portuguese, French, German and English. But this is not just Western European phenomenon. So if you press once again, in the Islamic world, very often the idea was that educated people from Morocco to, let's say, Indonesia or Malaysia spoke Arabic and Persian, Arabic being the language of religion and law but Persian being the language of culture and of poetry. And if you press again, in India, you have a situation again where you had Sanskrit and Persian or Sanskrit and Pali. So I would say one plus two is historically the most natural model of human education for the last 2000 years and for most of the civilizations in the world. Can I have the next picture? Now, Things have changed. 
Now, these are headlines which some of you might recognize. Few, I think it's about last year or about two years ago. Doctors give pupils sick notes to duck French and German lessons amid fears. The stress of learning a second language is harming their mental health. Well, the other is children find foreign languages so stressful that they are being signed off by a GP, head teacher said. So the narrative has changed dramatically from a situation which was clear that no proper education is thinkable without, I would say, one plus two, we arrive at a situation where basically being exposed to more than one language is perceived as a danger to people's mental health. Can I have next slide, please? Now, I think one of the problems I see at least, definitely as a neuroscientist and thinking from a different point of view is, to treat languages from a purely instrumental point of view. Because, if you press once please, we hear always English is enough. We can get along with English. We don't need any other language. And if you press again a couple of lines, if unavoidable for business, we can learn Chinese. And next line and for leisure, Spanish. Now, of course, such a way of thinking leads, can I have next line, please, to low status of all other languages, next line, please, particularly small and minority languages, and next line, please, immigrant languages. So what is the alternative? Can I have next slide, please? And here you have seen already some pictures from the school in Krakow, which I attended. And the pictures on the right is the aula where we went. And one of the pictures we are seeing was of a guy who happened to go to the same school as myself, namely Joseph Conrad. Now for Joseph Conrad, I don't know if all of you realize, English was probably fifth or sixth language, depending how you count. So, and he still, I would say, managed to write relatively decent English prose, at least some people would say. So, can I have the next uh, three lines? So, I think, apart from instrumental point of view, we learn it because it's good for business or because we want to travel there and so on. I would say we should see languages as a mental exercise, as a transferable skill from which we can learn things uh, in extending to other things and an extended and shared experience over space and over time. I think a narrow instrumental focus is really detrimental to the motivation because if we see languages like this, it doesn't matter whether you learn Chinese, which is the most spoken language in the world, or whether you learn Gaelic, where you maybe have 50 or 60,000 speakers and most of them will be bilingual in English anyway, because the mental exercise effect will be similar. In fact, I did several papers, uh, I will come in a moment, uh, about the effects of learning Gaelic on, for instance, attention skills. It's transferable because we're learning one language makes it easier for us to learn others. We can transfer this knowledge and we can transfer it to other things. And then, of course, the extended and shared experience is important, not only the literature. So can I have next slide, please? So all of this should be self-evident, but obviously it isn't as the headlines we have just seen show. So here I give a short compendium of what I would say are glottophobic prejudices. The first is that multilingualism, can I have the first line please, is just a waste, first line please, the uh, next line please, of waste of time, money and brain space. So basically Maybe it's okay, but we don't really need it. It's just waste. The second is even more serious because here, in the first, material is just unnecessary burden. In the second, it is confusion, something which is positively dangerous. And then there is a third point, if you press once again, please, next line, about which I don't have time to go into, but we can come in the discussion and so on. I would say multilingualism has lost purity that in a way, it is kind of morally right to have only one language, one loyalty. Okay, so can I have next slide, please? 
Now, the idea of a waste of space comes from, and can I have the next line, a couple of lines, please, comes from the idea that human language has own, or human brain has only limited space, and basically languages can take away space that is better there for other things. So here, for instance, after reading one of my papers, one of the, if you press again, uh, not necessarily a leading neuroscientist, but one of the leaders uh, of readers of Daily Mail commented on it. Of course, it's nice to have a second language, but I don't believe the science twaddle for one second. The human brain, I put the brain in red because brain is very used often used by argument uh, of by people who have absolutely no background in neuroscience whatsoever, but they believe they have a good understanding what brain is, can only contain a finite amount of information. And as English speakers, we are fortunate not to need a secondary language. That space, so here you have very much the limited space metaphor, couldn't be pronounced clearer, is much better utilized for science, history, or our rich culture. So basically, Brain is a, a chest of drawers. If you put too many socks into one, there is no place for t-shirts. If you put languages, there is no place for mass and so on. Absolutely no neuroscientific evidence for that whatsoever. Next line, again, if you press, is coming, in fact, from quite a well-known politician, Lee Kuan Yew. If you press once again, you will see the name, who was saying we have only 2 GB of gigabytes of memory in our brain. Therefore, we should not learn more than two languages. So again, the argument made with the brain by someone who has absolutely no neuroscientific background. So can I have next slide, please? So what does neuroscience tell us about it? Well, a very different story. So if you press maybe a couple of times so that we have the first uh, three lines to then these are the kind of i would say old fashioned limited resources models the chest of drawers analogy of the brain where you have strict static localization and next line competition for space this is completely opposite to the current understanding of the brain, if you press again, which is much more that of an added value model. So if you press again, so we know that the brain is interactive, that it's more than the sum of the ingredients. Next line. We have dynamic localization, neuroplasticity. Next line and emphasis on learning and adaptation. So in fact, and if you put next line, you see the source. So in fact, if we see language or a brain as a network, adding additional language is like adding another thread to a, a net. It makes a net stronger and not weaker. So basically, once we have things linked, it is much stronger, much better. Now, can I get to the next slide, please? So multilingual confusion here, this prejudice is, I would say, even more problematic because here it's not just about waste of time. It's about something which is positively dangerous. So the idea is if you are multilingual, can I press, uh, can you press please the first two lines? You all languages activated simultaneously, and that is the case. And in fact, you have sometimes slightly slower lexical access in multilingual. So if you show me a picture and I have to say, for instance, is a squirrel or not, then I will be probably slower than someone who is a monolingual speaker because I have to screen the squirrel, not only for squirrel, the picture, but also for Aishan, Chen, Ardija, or Vivian. So, next line. However, this increased challenge is exactly what leads to better cognitive control and monitoring mechanisms. So, to say that we should avoid this, so to say, effort of multilingual language control is like saying that we should avoid any physical exercise because it makes us tired. It's exactly the exercise which makes us perform better. So can I have next slide, please? And here you have a classical example, again, I would say, of pseudo neuroscientific argumentation. Sir, in 1923, was looking at Welsh speaking children. So if you put once again, the line, and was claiming that they performed worse at school because of confusion 
carried over from the brain area connected with language to those connected with other function. There is absolutely, I mean, no knowledge of any neuroscience in it. It's just brain is cited because brain sounds good. Can I have next slide, please? If you read further this paper, you realize that this is about politics and ideology, which is then dressed in the cloth of the brain, namely the idea that English language is coming gradually to prevail in subject states of Britain, Wales being one, Scotland being another, of course. The natives during this process passing through various stages of bilingualism. So we have a wonderful language hierarchy, the lower sta lowest stage of human language is to speak something different from English. Then you have a transitory stage where people speak their own language and English, and then you have the highest state in which people speak English only. That is the model behind it. Can I have next slide, please? Now, all in modern psychology, developmental psychology, neuroscience, neuropsychology speaks exactly in the opposite direction. So if you press the next line, we know from childhood onwards that exposure to different languages improves metalinguistic knowledge of spoken and written language. So kids in America who are from English-speaking families but go to bilingual English-Spanish uh, school are better in English orthography than those who go to English school. So not only do they learn in other language, their English orthography will be, will be better. Now, can I have next slide, please? This language switching, mixing, and context leads also to better development in the theory of mind. So basically, uh, basically, the, I'm just trying to get the best light. Uh, so basically, children find it much easier to realize if people have different knowledge of languages, they have different knowledge of other things in the world as well. So they develop what we call now social cognition or theory of mind much faster. And then Lux, uh, next line. And as I say, because they have to switch between those languages, that trains executive and attentional control mechanisms uh, and switching in also in other areas. Can I have next line? Everything has its price. So as I say, the price is a slower lexical access in terms of maybe 100 milliseconds. I would say that's a price worth taking for all the other benefits that we can get. So can I have the next slide? So I'm just going in three, four minutes through the kind of some research to illustrate it. So here, can I have next slide, please? We were using a test of everyday attention, which is a test which has been developed, by the way, uh, clinically, so it's clinically relevant uh, to uh, monitor rehabilit neurorehabilitation of uh, people with um, traumatic brain injury, often due to accidents and so on. So this is really relevant. It decides whether people can go to back, for instance, after, after brain injury to school, university, or to their work. And we found that, uh, if you press once again, that if we compare students in first year, where they only started learning languages, and in the fourth year, those who studied languages intensely have better attentional control. So that's the green line which you have in the top. So basically, the four years of study improve not only your knowledge of a language, but also your attentional skills, absolutely independently of languages. And next line, uh, next slide, please. So here you see Salmor Ostak on the Isle of Skye, the Gallic College, and there we were looking whether you find these effects even after one week of an intensive course. And if you press a couple of times so that we get the next couple of lines, indeed we found that there was improvement in all age groups between from 18 to 80. And next line, this improvement was stable in those people who practiced more than five hours a week, even nine, nine months later. Can I have next slide, please? And here we have now the studies of 
so if I have next slide, please, maybe we can go a bit faster through this one. So this is a study showing that, I mean, if you press once again, that in fact dementia is delayed by four years. And interestingly, among illiterates by even six years, in India, where we did the study, you can have many people who speak two or three languages relatively fluently, but never went to school. And in this group, the effect of bilingualism is even bigger. Six years, six years delay in presentation of dementia. This is enormous. This is much more than any drug that we have at the moment. And if we go quickly through the next slide, again, if you press a couple of times, so this was a study in stroke. So here we are looking whether there is a difference how fast people recover from stroke. So there was no difference in age. Can I have next slide, please? This is important because it means it's not that monolinguals are less healthy than multilinguals, that it is about the food or about any other thing. So if you press once again, there was absolutely no difference in the age. So the bad news is it doesn't matter how many languages you speak, it will not pre protect you from stroke. This is something where you have to have physical exercise, healthy food, and maybe medication. But if I have the table now, so if you press once, the outcome was radically different. So the monolinguals recovered much slower, so only less than 20% had normal cognition one year after a stroke, whereas it was the case in 40%, over 40% of bilinguals. So we have now evidence from several diseases. If you press again, next slide, please. Uh, so next slide, please. Uh, so and here, because you could say, well, maybe it's a case, can you press again, of the reverse causality. So it's not that learning languages make you clever, but cleverer people are more likely to learn languages. So if you press a couple of times, please, again. Uh, so here we were looking at so-called Lossian birth cohort. Some of you might have heard it. It's one of the best cognitive studies you can do anywhere in the world because Scotland is probably the only place in the world which tested the whole population of school children for their intelligence, even twice. So those who were born in 1936 were tested 1947 when they were 11 year old. And we can now compare how people compare now to what they were at age 11. So we can see that learning another language after age 11 led to better cognitive function than would be predictable only from uh, their childhood intelligence. So from this point of view, we can say, apart from the fact that, of course, if you are brighter, you might pick up languages easier, it's also the other way around. Picking other languages makes you perform better than you would because of your basis intelligence. So can you just press again? So here was the, the results here. So you have this effect of bilingualism on different measures of cognition. And now the last slide, which is basically my thanks. So if you want more information, I will put it in the chat as well. I would say probably the best way of is to follow me on Twitter. And I always, particularly after occasions like this, I always put links to different uh, papers, to different talks, and so on and so on, because in this case, it's very, very easy to update. So if you follow me either later today or latest tomorrow, I will be sending a lot of links, which then you can simply double click open. One thing is, particularly since we have, of course, many teachers today in the audience, so uh, you could help us enormously if you could fill in this short survey. As you will notice about learning and teaching, so in fact, if you are a teacher, uh, you probably learned the language at some point as well. So you can do two parts of the survey, one with your hat as learner and the other with your hat as teacher. And here we ask particularly, I'm very interested about learning languages at different stages in life. Now you can say this is a kind of, you know, why is it relevant I'm just teaching children? Well, I think it does matter because if children notice that also adults learn, then they improve their own idea about learning. I remember that once I was doing a Swahili course here in, in Edinburgh and it was during the school holidays. So I had my daughter who was then like five years old and I said, well, uh, the teacher, can I take her? Okay, of, fine. And she had, you know, her things to play, but she was very interested to see what was going on. And then after this, she said, oh, daddy. So I see adults learn as well. 
that was brilliant because that was in a way role modeling that was showing that basic learning is something lifelong. It's not something you have to do as a child and then you can throw it away because you're adult. It's something which you do with pleasure all your life. So I think from this point of view that there is for me a connection between a culture of lifelong learning and a motivation for children at school. So if you could fill in this form, that would be very, very helpful. And then if you just press once, uh, yeah. So, uh, and by the way, I will be putting, I will be putting in chat also my, my Twitter and uh, the link to the survey, which would be incredibly helpful. And then the last thing is I have links to several web pages like Healthy Linguistic Diet, where you can find a lot of blogs, talks, and so on. My personal page at the University of Edinburgh. And the last thing which I have on this slide is uh, the 27th of March, International Day of Multilingualism, will be organizing a lot of things. Again, I will be probably advertising it through uh, through Twitter. So please, uh, you know, join us. I think, uh, by the way, the date has been chosen because it's the day which is engraved on the Rosetta Stone, which I think is one probably of the oldest multilingual and most famous, particularly multilingual documents from world history. So thank you very much for your attention. And I would be delighted to answer any questions. Uh, and as I say, please do help us with the survey and hopefully keeping in touch via websites, via email. Thank you very much once again. Thank you very much, Tomas. And, and what I think you've done brilliantly is open up that wider context. That was a, such a powerful introduction. And the way that you moved on from that, I think, to throw out all kinds of challenges. Um, one of the things I was fascinated by was your assault on pseudoscience, because I, I've been doing a presentation called Never Mind the Bollocks, which is taking a very similar approach to the kind of attack in pseudoscience and selective research. And if you're being criticised by the Daily Mail and the Telegraph, you're clearly doing something right. Um, and I think you also made a whole number of interesting connections into the growth of neural connections, the development of the brain. And through that, I think, connections to creativity and our ability to think differently, to see ourselves more widely um, and to reflect that in the way that we act and think. So much appreciated. I'd also like to say a huge thank you to Noemi Gonzalez. I hope I've got the pronunciation correctly, who's been feeding some really good links into the, the chat line. I'd encourage people to have a look at that as well. Um, but now, while we wait for more questions to come in, it's giving me a really great pleasure um, to introduce Louise Glenn. Uh, Louise, as far as I'm concerned, is a force for good. Um, anything that Louise asks for, she can deliver. Um, it's a cliche, I know, but she's very much her own person. And I love the fact that we've got somebody in Education Scotland who is so fully themselves um, and so willing to engage with passion and commitment around the development of modern languages. Because not only does she see that as important, but she sees that as something that can reach and enrich the lives of all of her children. Um, and that's something that she achieved, I think, really well as a teacher and as a school leader and now as a development officer. And what I'm hoping that Louise will do is give us a kind of overview, if you like, of where we are in Scotland in relation to that wider agenda that you set, Tomáš, but also going back to the agenda set out by Catherine at the beginning. So, Louise, welcome to Creative Thank Conversation. Thank you very much. Thanks, Steve. Um, folks, I've not got um, any slides with me, so I'm just going to um, deliver just a, a you know a, an overview of where we're at with our one plus two policy. And I'm going to make a presumption that everybody in this room knows what the one plus two policy is, what the central tenets are, um, and I will share with you how the policy has landed over the last few years. Um, across Scotland. So my job at Education Scotland um, is is really, you know, I have responsibility for modern languages. I've worked there for nine years from the, the very minute that I stepped into uh, the doors of Education Scotland. I have had responsibility for um, supporting schools, supporting local authorities to implement the one plus two policy on behalf of the Scottish Government. Um, 
it's really interesting, Tomás has spoken about cognitive benefits and the flexibility of the brain and the prevention of cognitive decline that language learning brings. But I want to add, and I'm, I'm going to, Tomás has given us this lovely broad overview, and I'm going to narrow it right back down into schools, because um, I want to add to really, to, to what Tomás has said, that, you know, communicating in a different language and being un understood by native speakers of that language is for many people and many learners a really strong and a really um, such a, a worthwhile uh, pursuit for them because it's a source of joy and it's a source of pride. And to, be, to see your learners in front of you absolutely pleased with themselves, that they've had this opportunity to communicate with others, that they've made themselves understood, that they've listened to a native speaker, um, speak and being able to understand what they've said is a powerful, powerful message. So I was um, delighted when the um, Scottish Government did bring a, about the, the, um, the one plus two policy and it, it stems very much from the, the government's manifesto commitment which chimes with the, this Scottish Government emphasis on Scotland becoming and Scotland being a multicultural and a multilingual nation reflecting this political move towards being uh, or towards having a more international focus um, in Scotland and a focus indeed on the Scottish economy. And um, the central tenets of one plus two policy are also built on the fact that we are an outward looking nation. We need to continue to be an outward looking nation and we need to develop within our children and young people that knowledge of intercultural um, um, intercultural and, and interconnectedness of languages, but knowing about different cultures, that, that real importance of having um, an ability to see the world through somebody else's eyes. And that is what language learning brings to our learners. So the other part that, that was a, a joy to me about the one plus two policy, the other part, the other uh, central tenet was, you know, this the, the learning of languages, including learning English and Gaelic and Scots language, is very much a means of addressing and, and helping to close the poverty related attainment gap. For some children who are possibly in their classroom not the expert in numeracy or the expert at geography or the expert or the, you know, the the, the best um, painter or drawer in the class, they listen, they repeat, they are successful. And when they are doing that in a, in a, with, with their language there, they are, we are levelling that playing field for them. They are having a sense of confidence, they're having a sense of achievement that possibly other areas of the curriculum might not confer on them. So there's my soapbox. I'm going to step off it now and talk about where we are in terms of uh, languages in Scotland. So the one plus two policy launched um, 2012, so it's 10 years old. It's been given a 10 year um, implementation period of time with a recognition, of course, that transformative change, which is what the one plus two policy brings about, does take a while. It's a very ambitious policy, um, but it has been backed with substantial funding. And those of you that have heard me speak before, will um, no doubt be bored with me talking about the substantial funding, but this is the first time um, in my career as a teacher, as an educator, and now as a civil servant, that I have seen such a focus on modern languages or on language learning. So I'll take away a uh, modern from that. On language learning, we are in a unique position in Scotland that we have a government that backs language learning and actually shows the colour of its money as well. And that funding, which totals almost £36 million, of course, um, goes into local authorities on a per capita basis for five to 15 year olds and is really there to help to train and to upskill primary teachers who are, as we remember, generalists and not specialists and not, not necessarily linguists, so that they have got the, the skills and the confidence to be able to use the language in the classroom setting and also deliver discrete language learning on a progressive scale from primary one to the end of primary seven. And of course, the policy then uh, moves through into the secondary into and unto the end of S3. So 
hugely ambitious. But what you're going to hear from the teachers that are about to follow me is it is absolutely doable. In the history of language learning in Scotland schools, you may or may not be aware, aware of this, um, is pretty patchy in, in uh, primary schools in particular. So prior to uh, the late 80s, early 90s, we had the MLPS, Modern Languages Primary School Project, and that project it was. It didn't have substantial funding. It was very much based on goodwill of primary teachers. And it was, for those of you that are slightly longer in the tooth um, and remember this, it was um, kind of patchy um, for a number of schools in a number of clusters. Some clusters did it perfectly, some clusters did not, but in the, the provision was an hour a week, P6 and P7. But sometimes that language that was being taught in P6 and P7 wasn't continued um, into the secondary school. So there was no recognition, no, um, of, of those language um, or that language that had been developed. And prior to the late 80s and the 90s, if we go into the 70s, then we saw languages in Scotland's um, secondary schools only. Um, not many primary schools would, would have uh, languages in their P7. And really it was language learning was very much the preserve of academic students. And that made it very divisive as well. Um, so it was, you know, for the, the clever boys and girls that showed that they had an aptitude for English, were then allowed to take French and German or French and Spanish or or Latin or develop a, an, another uh, language to a certain level. And that absolutely excluded a heck of a lot of learners and precluded them from having an experience in which they may well have been successful. So. And can I just say that at this point, I'm just talking about mainstream state schools here. Um, parallel to this, in the independent schools in the 70s, the 80s, and right up to the, the present day, languages are thriving in the independent schools. Parents um, and teachers and learners in the independent schools are very much bought into it. It's part and parcel of the ethos and the culture of those schools. And why should it be that only pupils in independent schools can benefit from language learning? Absolutely not. So a kind of unfair reputation for modern languages kind of developed from there. Languages, um, then you can imagine the reputation for languages was that they were difficult. And even when I was teaching um, in Fife um, over a decade ago, your academic learners, those, those um, young people who were particularly good at English or at sciences, etc., would say, do you know, I'm, I'm swithering between taking German to higher level because there's not always a guarantee of an A there. They were, they were presuming that the language was going to be difficult. So a lot of things that we had to kind of bat down, if you like, in order to make this, this um, policy successful. And I do think we've done a bit of a vault fast. And by we, I'm talking about the teaching uh, profession have done a vault fast. We've gone from the, the zero to the hero. What we have in our primary schools currently, and this is post pandemic, where a number of um, language learning experiences were obviously parked for a while, whilst uh, the online um, education world was sort of kind of building up. But what we have now is that L2, that first additional language, is in almost 70% of our Scottish primary schools. And by that, I mean from P1 through to P7. A progressive and a coherent experience with enough time built in there to really deepen those language skills and a very different experience from that drop in method that we had under MLPS. And I think that is a uh, no mean feat to have kept that going. Um, despite a pandemic, we were up pre pandemic to 88% of our primary schools saying that they were delivering an L2 um, on a progressive basis and, and having a coherent experience so that those learners on that approach to second level were going to be much better um, prepared and had a, a depth of learning in their primary experience. And language learning was becoming just the norm, just a regular curriculum area. But the norm for them to be speaking the language because they were hearing it from their teachers, they were hearing it in the corridors, they were hearing it from, in some schools that I visited, from the dinner ladies, from the janitors, you know, just occasionally just using what I used to call throwaway items, throwaway terms, just the normalisation that language learning is 
for everybody and the normalisation of hearing different languages in schools. That is a complete vault fast from what we had even 15 years ago. Um, I'm just I'm thinking here about my, you know, just thinking about the normalisation of language learning. I, I shall digress and tell you one of my experiences. I taught in a lovely high school in, in um, deepest East Fife called Buckhaven, which is now Leavenmouth Academy, I, I believe. And um, I remember thinking, you know, I have absolutely cracked it as a teacher here. So to, you know, some of our learners um, were challenging, but I thought I've cracked it as a teacher here. I was in the staff base and the languages base and I was about to close the window. It was break time, it was a wee bit cold. Um, and when I leant out, I could hear these boys all playing football. And these boys were all in my French second year class. They're all playing football and actually said, and I'm not going to swear at this point, but they actually said, Pass moi le effing ballon, s'il te plaît. You know, and they were starting just using their French as de rigueur. Um, putting a wee, you know, a wee sweary word in there. And I just thought that is fantastic. I have made it here. I could actually retire. Um, anyway, so in our uh, to go back to what's going on in our schools there, in our secondary schools, we've got 100% of secondary schools. Every single one of our secondary schools, of course, is able to deliver. Um, I'm saying of course, but we have secondary modern languages departments um, is able to deliver the L2. Um, and that is up until the end of S2 there, not all of them are able to deliver um, the L2 until the end of S3. And that's to do with curriculum design and that's to do with uh, possibly staffing issues, etc. So remember, there is also the L3, which comes in, you know, no later than, than primary five. And absolutely, to go back to what Tomash was saying as well, builds on that ability, that's of the skills of learning that first language are built on through the second language and that was the opportunity that we really wanted our children and our young people to benefit from. A kind of buy one, get one free, if you like. You know, put in that hard work with your L2, your next language will be that wee bit easier and the next one after that, even easier. So it's always that building on the skills. And talking about the skills there, and I know that uh, Peter is going to be talking about this um, later on, about, you know, the, the transferability of the skills and what do we need to look at in terms of how we deliver languages. So we've got an aspirational policy. We've got young people coming in or coming through primary school and secondary school with a 10 year language learning experience behind them. So as they move in to taking their uh, national qualifications in the senior phase, what's our focus now? Because surely somewhere along the line, we're going to be looking at a rehash or a refocus of what happens in that secondary broad general education in terms of modern languages. We, we have to build on what the, the young people have learned pre coming into secondary school or else that would be depressing, I think is the word that I would use if we if we don't acknowledge the, the previous learning and build on it. And it's a lost opportunity if we don't. We maybe have to rethink the way in which languages are delivered how they're promoted, how they're embedded into the curriculum. Um, we maybe need to have a, a kind of what I would like to call a national conversation that we maybe have a look at some of those older contexts for learning um, in the high school and think, you know, can we leave this to, to the preserve of younger learners talking about their house, talking about their pets, talking about their birthday, talking about what's in their school bag? etc you know can we move that on can we then bring in more sophisticated context for learning i'm sure that we can so there's something that we need to do in terms of trying to fight against this decline in uptake of modern languages at national qualifications you know at all levels and i'm talking from nq2 to nq7 we need to do something to stop languages falling off that cliff and going back to the situation in the 70s when those languages were the preserve of the private schools and the more academic learners. And I shall stop there because I think it would be really interesting to hear from practitioners who are actually delivering this policy. Um, and also beyond that, uh, the BGE policy are also delivering on national qualifications. So 
I shall leave it there, Dave. I was going to say, I, I do want to open up some sort of national conversation that might come later on in the year. I, and I'd be delighted if teachers from Edinburgh would um, participate in that. Thank you very and much. Here, and here was me thinking we were opening up that national conversation tonight. That, oh, I, thought this <laughs> um, I mean, I think one of the things that's coming out of this, which is hugely powerful, is that we've been having the wrong arguments around languages for too long. Um, the, the kind of breadth and connections that are coming out in this conversation, both from the two of you, Tomás and, and yourself, Louise, um, but also from others in the chat, are, are hugely important. I mean, this is a conversation about culture. It's a conversation about connection. It's a conversation about the real importance of languages and the development of creativity, of communication, of our sense of the, ourselves. Um, and I love the theme that's coming through continually, both from the chat with Naomi particularly, but also from yourself, Louise, around the whole inclusive nature of languages mm -hmm. and the need to stand the views that we've traditionally had around languages on their head. Um, you know, we, we, we had that culture when I went to secondary school, if you passed your qualifying, because I, I went during the war and, um, you know, you, you got to do two languages and you went into mm -hmm. one eight and you got the, the enrichment of life. all of that. I think you've really moved that conversation on. But this also needs to be a conversation about practice. And as you said, Louise, vital that we hear from people who are actually currently delivering in our schools and classrooms. And we're starting off with Ross Anderson um, from Preston Street Primary, um, apparently opposite the Commonwealth Pool in a Victorian building. I hadn't met Ross before tonight, but I loved meeting him in the uh, conversation that we had in preparation for tonight. I'm just really pleased, Ross, to invite you to come in and give us your view from your standpoint on where we are in our schools with primary provision. Welcome, Ross Anderson. Thank you very much for your, uh, your very kind um, introduction there, David. So yes, um, I am a primary seven teacher here at Preston Street Primary School, um, and we are a, a friendly, inclusive and multicultural school situated in the south side of Edinburgh. Um, at our school, what makes it so special is we enjoy the cultural mix within our community and the first-hand learning opportunities that experiences that this provides. And what I mean by this is, at the last count, we, we spoke 26 different languages in our school. Now, we only have a role of 280 children. And this is what makes my school just so lovely to work in. It's a melting pot of languages and cultures and religions. A, a modern day world in which I think we can all, all agree on that we want to strive to achieve. Working in this kind of multicultural environment lends itself to languages. Because within my classroom, we have a tongue in cheek joke. And we say that Mongol <laughs> monolinguism can be cured. It's okay to fail at a language. It's okay if you slip up. It's okay if you mispronounce something. Okay, but at least just trying. And sometimes I forget about my learners in my classroom um, that, that the vast majority of them are actually EL speakers. Uh, English is an additional language. And I forget that English is their second language or indeed their third language because they have learned languages from a very young age in their home countries. So when they come to Scotland, and it may be that they're, they're moving here because of their mothers and fathers, because of jobs, maybe that their mothers, fathers um, are, are studying here. It's, but by, by, by learning different languages, they're, they're a lot more quicker at learning Spanish which is our uh, L2, and indeed Mandarin, our L3. What I'd like to do is I'd like to open it up to everyone. This is certainly something that I do within my classroom, and indeed my, my whole school. We try to teach modern languages by four basic language skills. And can anyone maybe possibly comment on these within the comments area? Can anyone tell me what these are? So the four basic language skills.
absolutely fabulous, Mary. Thank you, Tanya. So Mary's got all four of them, listening, speaking, writing, and reading. If you think about when you were younger, or indeed if you if you have children, think about the process. Think about the 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 way in which you learn a language. First, you will listen to it. You will, you will hear people say this. Mama, Dada, you will hear your parents say this. Then you say it back. Then you'll start reading, or you'll be read to. Then finally, you'll start writing this. This is the approach that I strive to incorporate within my class and indeed encourage the other teachers within my school to do. So you have your four basic language skills. However, depending on who you speak to, there could be a fifth language skill. And again, I'm going to leave this out to, to some of you to comment. Can anyone think of what this fifth language skill might be? I'll give you a couple of seconds to see if you can type this. Okay, interference, empathy, these are, these are all great things. And obviously it is, in, it is completely open to interpretation. What I've got down here is your body language your, or your cultural awareness. Someone's body language or cultural awareness is their understanding of the differences between themselves and people from other countries or their backgrounds, and especially the differences in attitudes and values. And I think this is very, very important, especially when you go further up the school, um, because children, um, they, 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 they get to see the bigger picture within their school and a bigger picture within within the world and where they are or where Scotland is within the world. And we all know that if we go to a different country, OK, even even if you speak English, OK, if you were to go to Australia, America, we all speak English, but our body language is different. We have different cultural awareness. And this is the same as, say, in, in Spanish. If you look at... Um, cultural things such as Easter. If you look at um, Easter within uh, Spain or indeed South America, Semana Santa, so much bigger, such a big thing compared to that of here in Britain as well. We also strive to incorporate um, volunteer language assistance. Now, there is an old saying that if you're a primary school teacher, you're a jack of all trade and a master of none. Now, this isn't always the case. Some people have passions. My passion is in languages. It's in traveling, learning, learning about new countries. However, sometimes I'm one step ahead of the children. I don't claim to be perfect in Spanish. And this is where um, the city of Edinburgh Council, and with thanks to Catherine and Bethan, they've implemented this fabulous program called Volunteer Language Assistance. And this programme is run by the One Plus Two Development Officers um, and Edinburgh University Students Association. So VLAs, or Volunteer Language Assistants, are there to support learning and language and culture by working with groups, individuals, alongside the class teacher. Now, they're not teachers themselves, but they have a passion for languages. Why shouldn't we tap into this? Why shouldn't we get... Um, fluent speakers into our classrooms to help our teachers, especially if some of our teachers don't feel 100% confident in teaching that language. Now, having a VLA within our school it has greatly enriched the experiences for our pupils, staff and families here at Preston Street. We have worked alongside some VLAs for, for three years, and I have this running joke with uh, Christina, our fabulous VLA, um, that I was actually gutted when she passed and she 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 graduated with her honours degree and it was because she was no longer there to help me. Um, we do have another person in to help us, Nicholas, um, first year with us and he is proving to be absolutely excellent. So what I'm trying to say is, is embrace your languages. If you're struggling, uh, if you have confidence, 
what I would say to you is possibly contact your high schools, contact your, your local universities, contact your, your, your parents, your carers, your community to see if you can get some of these fluent speakers into your classrooms. And it's not just for language. Think about the cultural experiences these children will, will, will get from it. Um, unfortunately, I think I'm, I'm running out of time. I'm going to pass you on to Peter, who is one of my colleagues at James Gillespie's High School. Um, we have a very close uh, relationship. Uh, I do firmly believe that primary schools should talk to our high schools. Why not? Especially in languages, we know that we have transition from primary seven up to the high school when we're talking about um, emotions and moods and things like that. Let's get the ball rolling. Let's start to 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 get our high school knowledge so it can seep down into our primary sevens and indeed into our primary schools. Thank you very much. Um, well. You've done everything, Ross. You've demonstrated passion. You've demonstrated commitment. You've thrown in some superb ideas. I, I wasn't aware of the Volunteer Language Assistant Programme. Just a stroke of absolute genius and grateful for the comments made about it in the in the chat. Um, but not only did you do all of that, you also introduced Peter. So there's no need for me to do that. It's Peter O'Connor. He's from James Gillespie's and he's going to fluently pick up the baton from that may I say, effervescent. It was like, your presentation was like Prosecco in, in the middle of a, a wine tasting. Brilliant. Thanks for that, Peter. Follow that, mate. I'm glad it's you and not me. Well, thank you very much to everyone um, who's spoken before. Tomas, I thought your presentation was great and gave us a lot of uh, food for thought. Um, Louise, too, great to have that overview. And Ross, thank you very much for making this a tougher gig for me. Um, <laughs> Ross is always so kind and speaks with such enthusiasm and comes across as so nice. I was kind of hoping I would get to go up first, but um, here I am anyway. <laughs> um, there, there were so many notes that I took during all of these presentations. There's no way that I can touch on all of these things. But I suppose just to touch back on a few of them before I give a sort of overview of our context from a secondary school point of view um, in Scotland. Just one point that you made, Tomas, you know, reflecting on my journey as a language learner, um, I was sitting here laughing at the comment that confusion is carried from one part of the brain to the other. And first of all, I wanted to question the authors of these things. Now, as you said, none of them are neuroscientists. It's quite clear that none of them are bilingual either. Um, do you know, I certainly didn't come back from my Erasmus year having forgotten how to make myself a cup of tea or to boil a pot of water or anything like that. You know, it didn't push. I'd maybe forgotten things for spending too long in the pub some my year abroad, but it wasn't the language learning um, that affected me negatively at all. Um, it was interesting as I was reflecting um, before tonight on one plus two and when that came in. So I've been a teacher in Scotland for 10 years now. So one plus two has pretty much been my career in teaching. Um, and it was interesting to think back to the views on it at the beginning. Now, with any new project, of course, you have your early adopters, you have people who are so enthusiastic about it, and also you have people who are maybe a little bit more reticent towards change, who hark back to the model that had been in place before, um, and who, yeah, who don't quite want to make that journey. I've been on several courses, spent um, five days with Louise um, on a course in Glasgow a few years ago and I think there was a general feeling there it was kind of halfway through the one plus two um, coming in five years in rather there was a feeling of enthusiasm that's why I would signed up to attend this course during our um, during the six-week holiday but there was also kind of a feeling I think of show us how to do it um, and what the message that Louise and other presenters were trying to get across was find something that fits your context and I think it's years down the line now that certainly we are still finding our way in some ways, but also have something in place that we're very proud of. And it just goes to show that when you stick with a programme, when you've got enthusiastic leaders, that actually once you reflect on where you've come from, you can kind of stand proud and you're like, brilliant, you know, we've made such progress. Um, really pleased as well, of course, to have such close relationships with our cluster primaries. And I'm overwhelmed always by the positivity of the teachers there and it really does have a massive impact. I think one of the things that's come from having languages so well embedded in our primary schools 
is that when learners come to the secondary schools, they already have an identity as a language learner. So we try our best to course them into the languages um, that they've done in primary school. Their L2 ideally, if not their L3. Of course, the secondary school staffing is always a challenge with that. But the learners are coming up at 11 years old saying that they've done Spanish, they are a Spanish learner and they have that identity and they have that enthusiasm that they want to carry forwards. I think the important thing with the one plus two model is, as I sort of said, that flexibility and being willing to reflect on how did things go last year? How did things go over the last two years, the last five years? And do we need to change anything? Um, this year in James Gillespie's secondary school, we are making changes to that. Again, we've tried out different things and now we're going to try something else. And as I say, it is just that the importance of having that flexibility. Another important thing, which um, I'm really pleased that actually in the audience uh, tonight, we've got my head teacher who's going to hear me say this and who offered some comments before. But it's so important to have a support of SLT. Um, you know, the people who control the timetable, um, the people who will give you the freedom to go out, um, you know, to see what other schools are doing, to um, invite you to speak at the cluster head teachers meetings about languages and put that importance on that. Enthuses staff to approach initiatives like one plus two and to carry them forward and therefore obviously to to reach some success there. Um, what else did I want to mention here? Yeah, I guess going into secondary school, the most important thing that we've tried to get into our learners is yes, that continuity with the L2 and to offer that, that's so important, but also to instill in learners a sense of the importance of language learning. So this is why we will have a big push on things like European Day of Languages, all these uh, sorts of things that offer you an opportunity to speak about languages and their importance, not just one, but any language the richness of cultures and as Ross quite rightly said you know to explore the richness that already exists in your school our school motto is about valuing diversity and I think that you know it's so important to do that and to tap into what you've already got there to give these learners a chance to talk about their languages to draw similarities or difference between them we're in quite a unique situation in Gillespie's high school as um, the Gallic medium education school and I've certainly found although I don't speak Gallic myself is that when I have the Gaelic learners for French, I'll say, is this the same in your language? And just open up that conversation um, about it. And you'll find that once they're making those links, we talked about the transferable skills. It's it's true, it really does happen. And with those learners who I had for one period a week, I would say by the end of the year, their level was similar, if not the same, as those having it for two per week. And I would bet my bottom dollar a large part of that is because of their experience of language learning and their abilities that they've developed along the way. Um, I think that you know, I'll kind of finish on, oh no, there's two more points I want to make. One is about pathways um, that we have in secondary school. And one thing that we've allowed this year for the first time is to study the L2 in S1 and S2, but actually in S3, the possibility with conversation around that and you know, advice and input from teachers, of course, is to drop that language and to pick up another one. I had a conversation with um, a boy today um, who was saying that he's going to drop French and pick up Spanish, and he is a talented linguist. He's very good at French. The reason that he gave for that was that at home uh, he speaks Hindi and that the vowel sounds were more similar, and so he might find that easier. Um, so you're looking at a boy there who's got two languages at home, Coming into school, he's picked up a good level of French and now he's picking up a good level of Spanish. And if that isn't a rich language education, then I don't know what is. Um, the pathways that we're offering as well, we need to be more inclusive with languages. And I think there is this, as Louise said, this old fashioned view that languages are, it is a traditionally academic subject. There's no getting away from that, but it's about opening up, making it more accessible for others. And as I've said from day one in my career, it's about providing, it's, it's our responsibility as educators in any subject to provide opportunities for students to experience success. And when they have those opportunities, when they leave your classroom feeling successful, when they go home and talk to the parents about the success that they had, even if that's the communication of just one sentence and getting a response back from someone, then that's what you want to tap into. Um, 
I think as well, yeah, so making it more inclusive, we've increased our pathways um, at Gillespie's as well this year. We have added in courses such as Languages for Life and Work. We have added in fast track beginners courses with an emphasis on the fact that gaining a national three or a national four by the end of that course is just as valuable for some learners um, as or for, for the learners who will do that as it is for the ones who will gain a national five. And so that they shouldn't shy away from that, that that is still success and still should be celebrated. And I think that's a big point in language as well is looking for opportunities to celebrate that success and, and to do that publicly as well. Um, finally, what was my final point? I've written so many notes here. Oh yeah, uptake in senior school and anxiety. I thought that was a really interesting point and it's not something that I've got answers to bring tonight, but it is something that is really coming to the front. We are looking at teenagers these days, in particular, I should say teenagers, certainly not just, but personally, I think social media has a lot to answer for. Um, I think that the pandemic, of course, has a lot to answer for. And you're looking at quite a vulnerable set of teenagers. And one thing to remember as language learners is that we are all on this side of learning a language. And when we say to our kids, go on, be brave, make a mistake, you know, we can laugh about our mistakes. Actually, what we need to realise is it's terrifying. And for those learners there in that position right there and then that fear is very real. And so what I, I'm very keen to do moving forward is to have some strategies, but I need to get even more and to bring more to the department about how we deal with that anxiety and how we deal with that fear and overcome it. So that, as I say, learners are experiencing success. The other thing as well, thinking about senior phase uptake, we have quite good numbers. And this is the last thing I'll say. We have quite good numbers in senior school. Um, and I think there, there are two things that go along with that. One is enjoyment. And it's not forgetting that we are learning with you know, learn with children. Once they go into fourth year, don't stop the games. Keep doing them. Keep the you know making it fun and engaging. Keep making them experience that success, even if it's not the national five outcomes, if it's low, whatever. The other is to help them see a purpose in what they're doing. And that, I think, comes from so many things, including your international links, your exchanges, which take a massive load of time and effort to organise. But I'll give you a statistic. The first year that we ran the Spanish exchange in James Gillespie's high school, 95% of students went on to study at higher from National 5. And in the National 5, 80% of participants got an A grade. So it just goes to show, take languages out of the classroom, make it real, bring people in from industry, make sure that the only people they see speaking a foreign language on, is not the teacher within those four walls. Take it outside of that context. Um, and, and yeah, any any questions on anything I've said, I'm happy to answer. But that's kind of a brief overview of our um, context in secondary school. Right, you you didn't really need to worry about going second. That was that was equally bubbly and effervescent, Peter. Well done. Um, and of course, a typical lying teacher performance. He told me before we started that he was just going to speak for a couple of minutes, and I said that'll be a first. And I have been proved right. But I'm not going to say any more because we're running short in time, and I'm really keen that we hear from Iona Brown, who has a responsibility for Gaelic provision. Um, in the city of Edinburgh. I'm delighted to hear Iona talking about leadership, about language and God knows what else. I'm not sure what's left to say, Iona, but I have every confidence in you. Iona Brown. Thank you very much, David, for that very kind welcome. And thanks everybody for um, such wonderful presentations this evening. It's been really great to hear about the different language learning that's taking place and it really gives me a lot of confidence to hear that we're all sort of thinking along the same lines. So face grammarly Ula, uh, a little bit of Gaelic to start us off and thank you very much to Beth and Owen who asked me to come along tonight and participate. And I suppose after Beth and had approached me I was thinking well what am I going to bring to this table? Um, and I really started to think about Gaelic itself and the language and, and what it really means to me and I suppose how I how I came to be in the position that I'm currently in. And I suppose I just started to think about how much of an important part it's played in my own life. 
um, my own background, I was brought up in a Gaelic speaking bilingual home um, in the Inner Hebrides, the outermost um, island of the Inner Hebrides, the Isle of Tyree, and I was fortunate enough to experience Gaelic medium education as well as um, be brought up in a bilingual home. So I've had the best of both worlds and I can recall my very first placement where I went to a Gaelic medium primary school unit and I was speaking to the principal teacher there who had responsibility for the, the Gaelic department and she was saying you're going to love this but it's more than a job working in Gaelic medium education it's it's a vocation and I can safely say that she has that she has been right and um, that has certainly been my experience and the commitment and the enthusiasm that you've heard tonight from teachers that are delivering language education is what um, the environment in which I work every day and incredibly fortunate to do so. Um, and we've spoken about the, bio, the benefits of bilingualism and they're widely known now and understood. It's fantastic to hear from Thomas tonight about all of the science behind the cognitive abilities of the brain. And I suppose what I want to move the conversation on towards is about the culture that comes with these languages that we're all working in and the benefits there. Um, and to me, we're, the vocation that I'm working in is about keeping a rich culture alive and building a sustainable future for a language in the 21st century. And I suppose how I like to think about it is um, a language that has very deep roots and that we are hoping to give you know, wings and take on to its, its next steps um, as we expand the hopefully the speakers of the language and um, the interests and where, where the language is spoken and not just taking it out of its more natural heritage areas and into the wider urban areas where, where we are, a lot of us based here in Edinburgh. And certainly the work that we're doing here at Thevna Park, it feels exactly like that. Um, we are a large and vibrant primary school. We're based in Leith in the north of the city. And we've got a school role of 429, including our nursery class. So we're not small. Um, and like um, Ross said about Preston Street Primary School, our children are very diverse. They don't come to us from Gaelic speaking backgrounds for the most part. We're extremely diverse and we've got 17 different home languages in use and a total of 40 different languages spoken across our families. So it is absolutely wonderful um, that they are choosing then to get, become involved in Gaelic medium education and really in, involved in the culture and the community as part of that. So the children that join our nursery um, and class one, they go through an immersion approach, which is a little bit different to the approaches that we have with the languages one plus two. So when our children come into school, they're completely immersed in the language. They are experiencing songs, rhyme, the play and the entirety of the curriculum is what we aim, aim to have through the medium of Gaelic from primary one all the way through to primary three. And that takes a huge amount of creativity from our practitioners who are very skilled in delivering that immersive experience. And that's what they're trained to do. And um, that's that's what we do day in, day out. Every, in, every exchange that you have with a child as part of your school day is an opportunity to bring their language skills on just that little bit further. And as many people have already mentioned, we focus on the four elements of language learning, but for us, listening and talking is the first and foremost area that we that we focus on and that is where our efforts go particularly in the nursery and into primary one the experiences that we offer children are very much about getting them to use the language that they're building and encourage them and i was really interested in what peter was saying about children having a bit of anxiety around perhaps trying a, a new language and you know, maybe thinking of that as more for secondary learners, but that is something that we also see in the primary school and it's our job to enthuse them and give them that confidence um, in, how, in how we're working with them and as part of how we teach them as part of immersive pedagogy is that sensitive error correction and supporting the child and scaffolding them in terms of how they are um, learning to use the language. So from primary one to three, our focus is on encouraging them, supporting them, giving them every possible opportunity to use the language and develop their skills in the Gaelic before in primary four we then introduce English language. English literacy is introduced at the beginning of primary four after the children have solidified their skills um, from primary one to three and we aim for the children to be broadly equal in their literacy skills by the end of primary seven as we hand them on to the secondary school. So um, 
really our, our daily work is that of primary teachers across the country, but we have an added layer in that we are looking to revitalise and sustain a minority language. And I suppose that is what drives many of us in our daily work. Um, the parents and the community, they, they are choosing to have an additional challenge, but an additional, a huge benefit for their children um, when they're taken on bilingual education. And that it not only experiencing a new language, but they're taking on a new culture and a role as part of the wider Gaelic community in Scotland. And one of the things that I love most about Gaelic is how descriptive a lot of our phrases are and I had included a little slide that was a, a wee quiz to finish us off and um, that just sort of showcases some of the descriptive language some of the idiomatic language that we do use and I have um, some very fond memories of working in primary seven where we were kind of looking really to extend their language skills that bit further and bring in lots of different idiom and as we know um, idiom it doesn't translate well into English so I, I gave you a couple of translations, some literal translations, and I was going to open up the chat to see if anyone could perhaps guess, and Donald, if he's in the audience at the moment, is not allowed to participate, um, if you could perhaps guess what they mean. So I think it's maybe, the, yes, that's the first slide. So that says, and literally it means he took that in the nose. So could anyone tell me what they think that that means? Um, with meaning rather than a literal translation. Just a bit of fun. That one's a tricky one. So this actually means that somebody took something the wrong way, um, maybe something that you said to them, something that they that they didn't like. And if if that they took yes, they took offense, David, exactly. So um it literally means that they took it in the nose and um it's it's quite a good one. So yes, to to take offense the next one, if we could move the slide on, nach buyegucht, how yellow for you? Any guesses as to what that might mean? <laughs> it means how how lucky you are. Maybe a project. Yeah, it means aren't aren't you lucky? aren't how yellow for you so not one that we would use in a literal translation and the final one ha and kill is fake nefila the music is all over the fiddle you might get this one uh, the lesson that i did about this was we were drawing the, what the potential meanings might might be so i don't know how you would draw the music all over the fiddle and how you might present that it's a really good phrase and it's when everything has gone wrong when everything has gone completely wrong and it's all inside out and upside down. Yeah. So that's just a little taste of how we work in immersive pedagogy at Binskoth Hevnepatke here in Edinburgh. And I hope you enjoyed a little bit of uh, Gaelic fun to end your Wednesday evening. It's been lovely to talk to you and I hope that you um, enjoyed that little snippet of what's involved in Gaelic learning education. Well, my music is always all over the fiddle, I think. Um, that was brilliant. Thank you so much for that. And one of the things I think that's come out from tonight is just the importance of teachers and teaching. Um, I mean, you know, I, I honestly have come away from this with a real sense that if I'd had the chance to learn with any of our presenters for tonight, I would have learned better in languages than I ever did. Um, and the whole emphasis that there's been on creative approaches and making connections and learning how to be more fully in the world, to respond more fully to that, and to become more. I think Tomas started us off very much in that theme. I'm sorry that we packed so much in, although I no idea what we could have taken out because we don't really have time to further explore. The chat's been interesting and I really simply hope that people will go away from tonight and encourage colleagues to listen to this, to watch it when it comes on our Creative Conversations YouTube channel. Um, and I hope that Tomashi will take on the role of lead tweeter on that. Um, thanks to everyone who's stuck with us. Um, thanks to all of our presenters. For me, that's been a brilliant and eye-opening evening. And it certainly made me think again about languages. Much appreciated. And thanks to everybody who's participated in the chat. Be safe. Stay safe. Goodbye.
कि नहीं